Dr. William Wright, um, addiction psychiatrist, and uh, welcome to Module 3, uh, Patient Evaluation. So let's uh, jump in and get started. So again, I have quite a few objectives uh, this time around. So number one, describing the goals of initial evaluation for patients with an opioid use disorder. Identifying important components of history taking for patients with an opioid use disorder. Explaining the rationale for physical examination of patients with opioid use disorder, or OUD. And identifying appropriate lab tests for a new patient. Describing factors to consider in treatment planning to determine if someone is appropriate for office-based opioid treatment or not. Um, and also, lastly, describing patient selection for full agonist, i.e. methadone, or antagonist, i.e. naltrexone um, therapies. So, starting it off, one of the most important things of any um, patient uh, physician encounter is building that therapeutic alliance, building that trust with uh, your patient. And especially when it comes to someone who has an issue with, with substances and addiction. They've already been I'm assuming, um, and most folks have um, interacted with other folks that have, have told them they need to get help, or they themselves have tried to get help and have run up against barriers. They've run up against folks that, that look at them with the, the stigma that we still unfortunately have in this country, in this world, when it comes to both mental health as well as those that are battling substance use problems. So it's so very important uh, in order to have this person get into the best treatment and long and recovery that they can by having a good therapeutic alliance to start with. And so how do we do that? How do we how do we make sure that, that happens? And the first thing is is our attitude. Um, this kind of goes without saying, but just being very non judgmental, being very empathic, trying to see out of, of their shoes and, and living their life and what's been going on. And you know, actually being interested and not just assuming that you know all the ins and outs just because somebody has a substance use issue. Again, becoming and being very respectful with somebody is it should be a, a, a given. Um, recognizing that people have, have gone through all kinds of issues in their own life, um, adversity, struggles. But also recognizing that each individual has their own unique strengths, things that, they, that have enabled them to get to this point in life so far. Nobody is without strengths. Everybody has something that, that has been beneficial that they can rely on that is a strength for them. As we mentioned at the very beginning, non-stigmatizing language, words matter, how we use words, what we say, the word choices that we have are so important. We may think it is just a, uh, a euphemism or a turn of phrase, but for somebody else, that can be a very derogatory or, or hurtful statement, um, and that can also disrupt this therapeutic alliance that you're trying to build. Being honest, both from patient to you, but also from you to patient, and not trying to, to cover anything up. Knowing that we both have goals that we're trying to achieve, but it's important to be mindful that you may have a set of goals, and they may have a totally different set of goals. And so being open, being honest, being um, communicative as far as what those goals are. Why is this person coming to you? What is it that, that is causing them to say, okay, I need to do something about this? And so also with, with that sharing of goals, it's important to kind of know in their own language, in their own terms, their own uh, vernacular, what it is their goal is. And so, you know, this is where, you know, especially when I'm writing patients up, this is where I use a lot of quotations that I use and try to, to hear from them what they're wanting to achieve. Again, I can have a, a particular mindset, but they may have something totally different. And if, we're, if we haven't communicated those goals together, then we may be missing the boat and they may think they're doing poorly because they're not meeting their goals. You think they're doing great because they're meeting yours and vice versa. Reassurance, reassurance. Folks are concerned about the confidentiality. They're concerned that it's coming to you. People will see them coming to receive help, that the cat may be out of the bag, that, that they're actually receiving help for their substance use and they may not think that other people know about it. So reassuring them that no, just like every um, doctor-patient relationship, that their, their confidentiality is, is sacrosanct. But, and this is a, a big but, caveat being that there are obviously some caveat for that. That in, in cases where um, their safety, uh, they're, they're expressing uh, self-harm ideations or, or otherwise um, harming of others, Tarasov, if everybody remembers their Tarasov, duties. Um, 
but also if there's there's issues of well-being to others, such as children, um, but also depending on the state, elderly as well. So keeping in mind that in those situations, and being upfront and honest with you, because again, it's it's um, duty as a as a physician and a mandatory reporter that if those things are present, those may be the times where the confidentiality may be broken. But again, it's it's due to safety of a person. What are our, our goals uh, for this 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 first evaluation? What are we trying to accomplish ourselves? And there's quite a bit of things that are going on, especially in the slide. And so you can be like, man, that's a lot of things to do in, in one evaluation. And and you're right. But obviously, just like most uh, medical evaluations, um, a lot of these things are kind of going on concurrently. So as we mentioned, the, the importance of trying to develop that therapeutic alliance, that trust that you have with the patient, which regardless of what modality of treatment you may find yourselves working on, the study saying that that alliance, that that relationship, um, is one of the most important prognostic indicators for somebody doing well. So it's it's really important. It may be overlooked a lot, but it is very very important um, as far as one of the goals of, of setting this up. Does this person trust that I am here to help them? If they don't, then it's kind of hard for them to come back to continue to receive treatment and get into recovery. Also, um, it goes about saying, you know, trying to get as much information as we can from uh, more than one source. As uh, well, the cliches go, there's uh, more than one side of a story. So we're trying to get all the, the different components of that story that we can so that we can have a, a clear picture of what's going on. And sometimes there's that one little piece that may turn the entire scenario on its head and be very beneficial or let us know that, hey, man, things aren't going as well as we thought. Then a comprehensive assessment, again, from the medical, the psychiatric, uh, labs, um, even physical exam are, are part of this initial evaluation as well. As we said in, the, in module two, two um, kind of going over and assessing the signs of withdrawal, um, specifically using um, tools and measurements like the, the kind of whole opioid withdrawal scale or CAL scales to kind of objectively um, categorize where somebody is with, um, and in their withdrawal phase. Using the DSM um, criteria, as uh, reported in earlier modules, um, is important. Again, words matter. Um, diagnosing and being as specific as we can matters. Evaluating for risk. Are they at a, at a potential harm for themselves to others? Um, are they at a potential um, risk for overdosing with either past behaviors uh, with overdose or current behaviors that are going on now? And then, of course, assessing, you know, are they an appropriate candidate for this type of treatment? Is there anything that would that would prevent them from doing well? Um, is um, OBOT, you know, an appropriate kind of scenario for this patient? And then finally, you know, coming up with a plan. That, that very last part of it is it going to be MAT, medication assisted therapy. Is it going to be just therapy? Are you going to have to have some referrals? What's going to go on? What's going to be the plan? And, and having all these, especially the plan, communicated to the patient is important. So before somebody even comes in and then during the, the moment, reviewing uh, the prescription drug monitoring program. Now, these are still up and coming for some places. They're still constantly being tweaked and, and modified and improved, but they're a valuable resource to us uh, when we're trying to evaluate and help somebody. Um, it is being able to you know, kind of see, are they getting any controlled substances? Where are they getting it from? Who are they getting it from? Are they filling early? What are the patterns? Um, and so I use um, PDMP, PMPs on a regular day in, day out basis. And it can actually help you kind of guide the interview and treatment planning. You know, not in a, in a confrontational manner, but you can, you know, just point blankly say, you know, I see that you've been getting um, X, Y, and Z from these different folks. And um, what can you tell me about that? Um, and so sometimes you can even prevent, you know, some miscommunication or flat out denial or even um, attempted subterfuge and diversion um, by having this information available. Now, um, PDMP registrations um, may vary state by state as far as what you need to do to be able to register and log in to PDMP. Um, however, um, I, you know, would highly, highly, highly recommend it. And honestly, I, I couldn't do a day in and day out. Um, treatment of folks if I didn't have access to um, a PDMP in my own state. A lot of states are, are coming together and, and finally collaborating with their PDMPs, and so they may um, communicate with each other. Here in North Carolina, our PDMP um, 
has mutual agreements with multiple different states. And so I can actually, with the same person's demographics, search different states to see if they're, if they're traveling and getting um, medications in other places, uh, which may be beneficial to you, especially if you practice on a border um, uh, between two states or three states. Um, having different sign forms, such as uh, obviously consenting for treatment and what that treatment is going to be like. Um, releases for other entities, you know, whether that's family, whether that's other physicians, getting that collateral information, again, like we said, is so important. And then the treatment agreement, of what it is, what this treatment is going to look like. Now, different clinics may have different policies as far as um, what that treatment agreement looks like, or even what, you know, documenting certain things like diagnoses are. So it's important to kind of understand if you are working in a system, what those requirements are. Um, some examples can be found at the, the, the link that's posted um, or um, in, on the PCSS website as well. So the team, is it just you? Are you working with other folks? Who are on your, your clinical team? So there's multiple different models. There's many models and many different teammates as you know, the stars in the sky, it appears. Um, so are you... Solo? Are you by yourself? Are you going to be um, just the medication manager and, and prescriber? Are you going to do that as well as, as therapy? Are you going to refer out for therapy? Um, do you have a multidisciplinary team? Do you have nursing staff? Do you have uh, nursing assistants, and CNAs and CMAs? Do you have counselors and therapists involved? Social workers, case managers, front office staff. All of these things, though, it may not um, appear important or important. When you think about the patient experience and, and how the person that is coming in to you for help is is being addressed and, and what they're seeing. So it's important to know for yourself who's a part of that team, a part of your team and the patient's team, um, as well as their interaction and their roles in that patient's recovery and their treatment. So because of that, it, you know, you can either have some false starts but also you can have some really good care. And again, everybody's role in a treatment team is, is important um, because that's that little piece that is getting somebody hopefully doing better. So all staff really need to, to, to be kind of on the same page. They all need to, to know that they, um, they're they part of the care for the patient, they're part of the process, and that no, no um, position or, or role is, is minimal. But it's always, always, always a focus on what the patient's needing, what can we do to make the, and help the patient get better? So because of that, if you're especially in, a, in multidisciplinary teams, or even if you have uh, referred out, that you have regular kind of process reviews as well as interactions with those different teammates and different parts of the, the team structure to make sure that you're on the same page, that you know um, things are being missed and, and um, falling through the cracks. So moving on to objective two, identifying uh, important components of history taking for those with overuse disorders. So uh, there's always a good, 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 thorough medical history is vitally important. Uh, reviewing symptoms, um, reviewing labs, relationships with, with other medical symptoms and their substance use. We're trying to potentially get a, a chronology, a temporality, you know, what came first, chicken or the egg, are they happening um, at the same time? Had ever had this problem before? Is this their, their fourth or fifth time tre through treatment? Um, can definitely help you understand the patient better, as well as what they've been through, what they've done for treatment. You know, has it been a medical intervention, a surgical intervention? Getting a thorough medical history um, is not just you know part of documentation billing, but also to help you understand the patient, where they've been, what they've been through, what their body has been through. So it's, it's so important to, to have a good understanding of that. For the, the folks that are able to give birth, you know, kind of understanding where they are. Are they trying to have more children? Are they not? Are they unfortunately infertile or not? Um, again, those may be um, important key components, both for their, their psychological and, and, and physical health, but also um, for you. Um, if somebody gets pregnant, what are we going to do? Um, are you planning on getting pregnant? If not, what are you doing to, to prevent that? It's also an important um, part of this process and, and questions. One thing that's often overlooked is those good old chompers, those white teeth you got there. Um, when folks are um, tend to having significant issues, we're overlooking routine care for ourselves. We're 
probably not going to the doctor regularly. We're probably not having the best nutrition. We're probably not taking care of ourselves the way we should. And one of the things even um, us medical professionals, physicians, sometimes overlooked is also that dental care. And so encouraging and, and uh, addressing where the status is with your dental hygiene. Are you going to the dentist or are you not? How long has it been? Um, because as they start feeling better, that's going to be an important aspect. You know, if they're in a um, tremendous amount of mouth pain or they're having a lot of issues with eating, that's going to possibly interfere and interact with your, your treatment. So it's important to, to keep that in mind and not have that as an overlooked um, portion of their medical history. And of course, it goes without saying, you know, medications. What have you been on? What have you not? What kind of reactions have you had? Um, how long have you been on medications? But a lot of folks still say that, well, X, Y, and Z didn't work. It just didn't work. Okay, and you may take that at face value. Well, how long were you, how long did you take that medicine? Oh, I, I took it for a day, didn't do anything, so it didn't work. We, we, we know that um, most medications don't work within a day. You got to give them time. And so if somebody has not had a good therapeutic trial, don't necessarily throw the, the baby out in the bathwater. We may be able to revisit that with some coaching, with some um, education on the patient's um, standpoint, that this is possibly something that we need to look into. Also important, you know, do they have a history, self-reported or not, of losing their medications or having it stolen? Um, have they ever been in, in treatment agreements with other providers before? Have they gone through that process? is an also important um, pieces of the puzzle. As a, a psychiatrist at the end of the day, obviously big into the psychiatric history and think it's so vitally important as well. So a, a good psychiatric review of systems, what's going on currently, what's happened in the past. Again, like medical issues, there may be some, some timeline issues. Did somebody start using and then develop significant mood disorders or, or psychotic disorders or even anxiety disorders, all of these things, which came first, the chicken or the egg? We can, if you just throw it against the wall and just assume we may be missing the boat and, and treating things unnecessarily or with the wrong thing. So it's very important to, to get a good sense of that as well. Have they, again, been diagnosed with, with things in the past before um, coming to see you? As we mentioned in module two, adverse childhood events, and experiences or just trauma in general have they been through significant issues in life that's going to affect how they respond and how they react stressors life is full of stress nobody's got a perfect life and if you do i'm not sure i believe you so also understanding what things stress them out what things are beneficial is important and also can help as far as coping strategies and mechanisms in the future much like the medication, have they tried different things in the past? Have they been an inpatient or medically assisted withdrawal? Have they been in residential programs? Have they been in IOPs or partials? Have they just an outpatient? Or have they done none of that? They were totally brand new and naive to the entire system. Understanding that you know, and, and where they're coming from and potential biases um, can be very beneficial. Let's see what other psychotropic medications. Are they also concurrently on a benzodiazepine or other medication is important for you when you're thinking about interactions and treatment. So with getting these histories to the last thing I'll say before moving on is sometimes getting these these particulars can also help you, especially where they've been um, in treatment, outpatient versus inpatient versus residential versus PHP, can also give you a sense, you know, if things escalate, if things deteriorate, if things don't go um, where we'd like to go, how open is this, this patient in, in possibly getting a next level or a different level of care? If they are staunch, say, nope, this is all I'm ever going to do, that's going to be important for you to know, too. Um, there may be some resistance there. Or things may need to be handled differently if they're unwilling to, say, go into a detox because you can't um, and it's not safe to be managed on an outpatient basis. Social family history, again, important aspects of the overall um, good, thorough assessment. Family history, as we mentioned in module two, there's that 50-50 nature-nurture 
component to um, this disease, what we call addiction. And so do they have a family history of addiction, especially in, in primary relatives, mom, dad, brother, sister, kids? Um, it's important to kind of see that picture revolving in front of you. But again, with the, the high concurrence of psychiatric disorders and substance use problems and the high um, generic, genetic heritability of psychiatric illnesses, does your family have psychiatric issues is also an important um, question to, to routinely be asking. So going back up to the social part, it could be one of those that we take for granted and skip over quickly. But again, these, these details give us a sense of who this person is, where they have been, what they want to do, what their goals and aspirations are. And th that's vitally important, in my opinion, in order to fully treat and fully um, recognize this full character that we have in front of it, in front of us. They are not just um, a substance use patient. They are a patient that has substance use, yes, but they're also a mom. They are a college graduate. They are someone that, who loves giving back to the community with volunteering. Those are important aspects to understand what's driving them, what is um, making up who they are. So these components are not just something to, to, to check off on a, on a checkbox. They're important to understand who they are, but they also may impact and help us um, in the future in treatment. And of course, you know, a biggie, the substance use history. Um, what kind of patterns are, are present? Um, are they um, a long-term user with, with significant um, set-in patterns? Are they just starting out on their, their addiction journey? So asking, asking about all kinds of things is important. So not just opioids, but other substances as well. Um, so obviously opioids, that's prescription versus illicit, um, things like heroin. But also even if it is prescription, is it prescribed to you? Are you getting it from somebody else? Are you getting what you think is a prescription or is it actually being pressed? Well, you know that or not. Um, also, the concurrent substances, don't forget, don't forget, don't forget. Um, alcohol and tobacco um, kill more folks yearly um, than even our opioid epidemic. So those are vitally important to ask about as well um, for the safety of our patients. And of course, marijuana being a big topic as far as different states having different um, legal statuses of it and different perceptions and perspectives from patients as well as their ongoing marijuana use. So it's important to not discount, but also get a full good history of, of all the substances they may use. Um, that includes when did you first use anything? When did you first use each individual substance? Did you, is there kind of patterns that are emerging? I mean, are you using a particular frequency, a particular amount, a particular way? Have you progressed in your, your use? Uh, did you um, start out with just pills and now we're injecting and now mainline injecting? Um, did you jump into it injecting? It's important to kind of know those kinds of patterns as well. Obviously, assessing recent use, how much, any symptoms, any withdrawals um, for somebody um, actively in front of you. Are they suffering from cravings? Again, that's a, a big component. Oops, as we mentioned, focus on withdrawal and trying to prevent withdrawal, but the cravings and the control afterwards are just as important. We have found more so in getting somebody through withdrawal. So the cravings and the lack of control is what's going to have them going back into use. So again, um, all these components of, of uh, the use history is important. Such as also is their relapse to treatment, as we mentioned with um, their, their previous history. Have they tried multiple times and have had multiple relapses? What's their longest period of time in absence? When they have unfortunately slept and they relapsed, what happened? Um, what was going on? Was it a, you know, could they put their finger on exactly what happened or was it um, felt as if it was totally out of the woods? When they were successful, well, also what was helping them be successful? Sometimes people overlook the successes they've had and think that just because, well, that worked then, it's not going to work now. That's not necessarily um, true either. Um, so when doing those things, we can sometimes identify triggers and cues to folks having their relapse. Treatment episodes, how have they done in the past? Have they had um, good responses to different types of treatment? Um, had they gone to treatment and absolutely hated it? That's important as well. Like, well, that didn't do well for me. I didn't get anything out of that. I didn't like it because of blank. 
figure out what blank is can help you then modify your treatment going forward. Especially when it comes to um, some of the support groups, the anonymous groups. Folks can have a very strong opinion um, about those groups. However, some of those opinions may be influenced by a single episode. And so it's good to know, you know how and how frequently they've been uh, using those. So as we discussed in module one, especially in the, in the consequences of our, our substance use, that is sometimes the the breaking point when somebody goes from dabbling and experimenting into having um, significant issues um, and use disorder is the effects and consequences of our use for ourselves. And, you know, that includes, you know, physiological effects. Again, as we mentioned in module two, that tolerance, that intoxication, those withdrawal phases, have they experienced those things? Have they not? Um, have they had major issues when they've, they've come off and they had complications have they had an overdose when they were in the icu they have something that happened and they they fell and hit their head and started having seizures all these complications that coming from these these different phases but also the the other consequences has it impaired your functioning um, have you started doing things that you wouldn't normally do those um those unusual behaviors have you started nodding off have you found yourself, you know, kind of withdrawing and um, having some of the negative stuff. Have you started having problems with work family, with your um, regular family, with paying bills, with, with the legal? All those issues, all those consequences are important to understand and get a get an understanding and handle of for this person because again, that may be some triggers and also some some hooks that we can have to help and get them motivated in, in getting into recovery and treatment. Now again, you know, different clinics may have different policies and protocols um, for kind of documenting this stuff. So, you know, all these components, you know, may look differently depending on where you go. But remember, you know, recovery is a process and and changing behaviors, changing thoughts, changing mindsets into uh, a more recovery oriented um, habit takes time. It's not going to happen overnight. And so, also relaying that during this evaluation to the patients and those kind of empathic motivational interviewing files. So, um, substance use screening um, for diagnosis and assessment. So, goals. So, we're trying to identify those um, individuals that are at risk you know, with active substance use. Um, with other substances that may need some additional evaluation or maybe. Uh, additional levels of care when diagnosing patients who, who meet um, criteria for substance use disorder, developing that recommendation, that plan, that treatment uh, mindset, that modality that we're going to um, implement to get somebody into recovery. And as I hopefully have been reiterating and iterating over and over again, the biopsychosocial needs of the patient. Again, this is not just a patient that has a substance use problem. This is a full person with goals and issues and problems, but also strengths and character and, and people that care about them. So sometimes um, in this whole process of the initial evaluation, we do use um, screening tools uh, for different substances. So there is a, a drug abuse screening test, the DAS-10. There's specific things, you know, like for withdrawal, like the, the cows that we mentioned earlier. Um, for alcohol, you know, there's things like the audit, the alcohol use disorders identification test. Um, and for obviously, as a psychiatrist, um, one of my loves as far as helping folks, scales for things like depression, uh, the PHQ-9. There's also scales for anxiety, like the GAD-7. There's, there's multiple ways of, of getting some of this information, um, both in an interview, one-on-one -on -one with the patient, as well as um, from the patient themselves without interaction but it's all information and information is, is good and it's also as we said good to get a handle on co-occurring substances because they're prevalent um, at least uh, roughly 10 percent of folks have if not more so co-occurring substance use um, disorders on top of their opioid disorders and of course those may interfere and in, 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 
um, impact your treatment of someone with opioid use disorder. So folks say, well, can't we just use, you know, like a cage questionnaire? Well, um, for alcohol. Well, sometimes the cage can fail to identify a lot of folks that are at the at-risk at drinking level um, who don't necessarily have the um, alcohol use disorder kind of severe or moderate level. Um, so it's important that we also think about those folks that are even at the at-risk level. So the cage does well as far as picking up the dependent folks, but um, the audit um, usually does a, a better job of picking up folks that may be kind of on the border at the at-risk drinking. As we mentioned, um, the clinical opioid, opiate withdrawal scale, um, otherwise known as CALS, objective um, uh, scale. I know that's very, very tiny and blurry to see, um, but trust me, um, there are multiple different um, portions of this uh, the scale that you can, you can find along to. Um, but again, it's, it's an objective scale um, with different um, Likert scaling in there um, as far as, you know, Sounds like they're the pulse rate, they're the sweating, restlessness, um, their pupil size. Um, are they having bone and joint aches? Um, are they having that rhinorrhea uh, or tearing of the eyes? Um, are they starting to have that GI rumble? Are they starting to have some looser bowels? Are they having any kind of tremor shakes? Are they having any yawns? Anxiety or irritability? As well as the, the pilot erection goose flesh. And then you can score that. And then as you can see um, on the left, depending on what they score is kind of where they are in the withdrawal state. And so obviously when we think about in the future, um, induction kind of stuff, we're definitely obviously wanting to aim um, for that five to 12 at least, but more often than not, probably um, closer to that 13 to 24 um, range. As mentioned, um, the audit is a, um, a scale for alcohol use um, with 10 questions. So again, not very long, not very, um, laborious, but it can definitely kind of start picking out some of that at-risk behaviors and not just um, uh, the, the dependent drinkers. I know cage is quicker, it's only got fewer kind of questions, but seriously think about um, using things like the audit instead. PHQ-9, um, again, a little blurry, hopefully it's um, a little more visible for you guys. Uh, the patient health questionnaire 9 um, to assess where folks are with uh, regards to depression. Again, you know, getting a sense of where folks are, chicken or egg, it's important. Moving on to our next objective, explaining the rationale for the physical exam um, as well as labs. So why should we care about a physical exam? Well, um, hopefully it should be self-explanatory, but um, it may not. So the physical exam can give us a lot of, of good information um, as far as potential medical complications that are happening now, but also medical complications we need to keep in mind going forward if somebody has been, been using it in different manners, um, or just um, ramifications and sequelae from somebody's use. You know, have they been, inject been, inject been injecting? I apologize, my southernism is coming out. Do they have abscesses and, and things like that that we need to, to look on. If they've been injecting, then are we listening for murmurs? Are we, are we um, finding any kind of infective endocarditis um, issues? It's so vitally important to, to keep in mind the physical exam because it can give us things that the patient may not be aware of themselves, that we as, as physicians and, and medical providers understand being very serious. So don't overlook um, a physical exam and documenting as such. So as we mentioned um, in uh, module two, um, won't necessarily stay on this slide very long, but just continue to remember both the signs of intoxication as well as withdrawal. Remember, um, intoxication, kind of more on the depressed side of things. Um, withdrawal, I like to think about, um, I'm a pretty big sci-fi nerd, Star Wars fan. So think about like going into hyperdrive, you go from depressed to hyperdrive. So intoxication, withdrawal. Lab testing, especially in the initial evaluation, um, it can be beneficial, um, sometimes not always done um, at the, the very first, but definitely recommended again. Data is data is data. It can help us understand where somebody is right now and also potentially some of the things where people are going. 
certain things like a pregnancy test. You know, uh, uh, folks that are able to bear children, are you currently pregnant? Or are you not? Um, urine drug screens, again, part and parcel uh, of um, substance treatment is kind of monitoring um, drug screens, even at the, the outset. Um, so again, a, a piece of information to see if somebody is still actively using, but also a, a talking point, you know, if it is still positive, what happens? That's going to be you know, discussed later. But other things can be helpful. A CBC, um, a CMP, one thing that is definitely starting to creep back up more and more, um, especially with uh, more injections um, now is, uh, is bloodborne pathogens such as Hep C and HIV. So, Next objective, describing factors uh, to consider in treatment planning to determine if somebody, is this person in front of you, a good candidate for office-based opioid treatment? This level of care, what, what is it? So, and what goes into it? So several factors um, should be kind of kept in mind um, when thinking, is this patient going to be a good candidate um, for this type of treatment? So. Obviously, number one, what is their diagnosis? Uh, if they don't have a diagnosis for it, hopefully you're not going to be prescribing for it. Do they have other issues going on? They can keep in mind. Are there other issues that are going to interfere and potentially make this um, patient not amenable or able to, um, to do these, uh, this type of work? Um, the physiological state, um, are they at high risk for overdose? Are they not? Um, stability, um, insurance, again, the, the bugaboo of, of healthcare. Um, is trying to offer this treatment going to cause more harm than good? Or that there's to no harm. Are there available options for this treatment? Are you doing an assessment that you are not going to be the one that's going to continue this type of, of care? If not, is that care available where they are? Can they actually obtain that care? Does the patient want it? You know, again, that, that whole goals thing that we mentioned in module two. Do is your goal for them being on this, or is it theirs? Is it shared? If they don't want it, again, patient preference. And, you know, just a logistical. Can somebody actually adhere to a, the appointments that you are recommending and requiring, the direct testing recommendations, all the, 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 the I's and the T's that need to be crossed, are they able to do that and complete it um, satisfactorily? So as you mentioned, um, Insurance, uh, the the ghost in the room when it comes to healthcare coverage, um, especially here in the states. So it can definitely be state specific and very state by state. So um, somebody may be coming from out of state and they had great treatment options and, and insurance coverage from the state they were coming from and coming to you. It may not be as, as good or vice versa. Insurance policies may vary um, what types of treatment and how long the treatment they are covering. So again, understanding kind of the ins and outs of the, the patient's insurance. And that may be more than you um, understand. Um, a lot of times it's more than I can keep a hold of. So sometimes having, well, again, part of the treatment team, um, multidisciplinary team, having somebody that understands these ins and, out, ins and outs may be beneficial. Because you know most policies will cover one or more of the following, you know, definitely given the, the healthcare parity laws now. Um, so some will fully cover assessments and, um, and, and detoxes or medically supervised withdrawal or outpatient treatment. Um, but, you know, depending on other factors, you know, they may or may not cover this formulation of medication. They may not cover residential. So as uh, sometimes um, pain in the rear as it is, insurance is a, a big um, component of the, of the process. So other factors to consider. Um, like we mentioned, can they can they actually adhere to stuff? Are they stable? Are they in a position in life where things outside of them are stable enough where they can can be um, a part of it or not? Are they taking other medications that are going to possibly interfere, um, such as naltrexone? Obviously, um, an agonist and an antagonist at the same time kind of spitting in the wind. Are they on other substances like benzos or other sedatives that may interfere with um, concurrent treatment with um, medications like buprenorphine? Um, for you in your setting, um, you know, do you have call coverage? 
Do you have resources available to adequately provide treatment for this, this patient? Are the treatment programs available that will accept your referral um, if, again, this person, okay, they've been in our treatment for outpatient for X number of times and things have escalated and we need to go to that next level. Are there people that are going to accept your referrals? And do you know where those referrals are? Um, again, is the patient willing to possibly do that? So some general principles um, before even starting on um, this office-based um, treatment. Again, first meeting the assessment can give you um, to, to give individual information about what MAT is um, as an educational part of what we do day in and day out. So appropriate use of, of medication, um, are they diverting it? Are they sharing it? Um, obviously, that's misuse, um, and we want patients to, to only use it for themselves. Avoiding continued drug use and alcohol. Um, while and, and treatment. Again, all these, these components of psychoeducation. Needing to, to let you know um, if at any time other medications are being prescribed, to keep in mind, okay, well, now this person is going to be on some more um, blood pressure medicine. So initially, they may you know, have some reactions to that. If I don't know if they're on that medication, I may unfortunately wrongly assume maybe they're being over medicated or not using it because I'm seeing them kind of. I'm sleepy and somnolent. So again, that that data, that that release of information, that communication with different providers, the patient is important. Obviously, the education of how to, to safely store medication, and how the patient is going to do that, how they they plan on making sure that their their medication is not stolen or lost, or washed in the washing machine. How many times I've heard that particular story? Hey, doc, you know, it was in my pocket and I washed it. And, um, you know, what are we going to do about that? And, you know, during this initial evaluation assessment, um, principles going forward, are they prepared to be inducted? Do they know that they need to be in multiple model withdrawal? Do they assume they could just go from one to the other, uh, back to back? These kinds of factors, from a psychoeducation standpoint. So a big topic is the concurrent substance use and office-based treatment. Um, is this suitable? What do we do? How should we how should we handle these different scenarios? Um, so alcohol, obviously, again, it's in that depressant kind of family as well, and, and being a sedative hypnotic. So patients should obviously be cautioned to avoid alcohol use when taking the morphine because again, they're both um, depressants. They can both um, lower things, including blood pressures and heart rates. So those that have active or current alcohol use disorders may need to have either um, medically managed uh, withdrawal, i.e. detox themselves um, before starting, or um, you know, depending on their level, at least maybe cutting back on their alcohol use to, to prevent interference. So it's also important uh, that um, to assessing, again, for use intoxication withdrawal from set of hypnotics. If they're at risk for withdrawal seizures, um, it's important that the, they, they get the appropriate level of treatment to make sure that those complicated you know, phenomena do not happen. But also sometimes the misconception and misnomer and, and misunderstanding from, from folks is that just because you're on buprenorphine, it's not going to stop you from having those withdrawal seizures because it's not an anti-epileptic. So patients may say, well, I was going to be okay because uh, I'm taking this medicine. Well, that medicine is not going to be covering for that. So, well, again, that's why initial um, getting a good substance use history of all substances is important. And the big one, other drugs, um, especially things like marijuana and cocaine. So it's it's not an absolute contraindication um, to treatment, but it is definitely one of those things to have significant ongoing um, conversations about. It. Um, and you will have them probably regardless of whether you want to or not. Um, so in, again, the harm reduction mindset, you know, exploring why they're continuing to use, um, are they willing to abstain, are they not? Um, and just obviously documenting this discussion. And I know you're gonna hear a lot of arguments with, well, it's legal in my state. Well, it's legal in this other state. Um, it's a natural product. And again, that is an entirely um, 
different lecture that we can have a long discussion about as far as cannabis use and anywhere it is. But it is a very prominent and prevalent um, co-occurring substance. So, you know, having knowledge about where, you know, clinical policies um, stand for you and your organization are important. But again, knowing that it, it shouldn't be an absolute contraindication. We'll definitely have folks that had co-occurring cannabis use disorder as well as opiate use disorder. And in the process of, of treating their opiate use disorder with buprenorphine and learning coping strategies and coping mechanisms and, and the other um, non-pharmacological parts of the, the, the treatment, which are important, if not even more so than even medications, they found that they didn't need, they didn't require, they didn't desire to use as much of the substance as they thought. So it may turn out to be a good thing for them. So um, non-prescribed medications um, and uh, outpatient um, treatment. So again, they may benefit from um, completion of something more intense um, like an IOP or even residential treatment sometimes when they're having um, co-occurring non-prescribed um, use of other things. Um, but it's also important to know that buprenorphine is a, is a treatment for opiate use disorders and not specifically other drug use disorders. As I mentioned in the, the previous example, you're treating the opiate use disorder with the buprenorphine, but there was a positive sequelae that the cannabis use um, got better. But we were not specifically telling them this buprenorphine is going to be treating your cannabis use. Um, so it doesn't have any direct impact on cocaine, amphetamine, cannabis, alcohol use. So again, as we said, we may see some reduction in that. So misuse of other stuff, especially stimulants, um, amphetamines, can be pretty prevalent among um, those with opiate issues. And again, as you can imagine, it can sometimes interfere with um, ongoing treatment. And don't overlook uh, prescribed stuff. You know, there's definitely some literature and some anecdotal folks you know, talking about gabapentin, um, as well as other substances uh, that, that folks have. Some folks with um, quantity and prescriptions may um, have issues as well. So don't look even overlook even prescribed medications. So on the diversionary side of things, um, examples. So how how can we discover? How can we um, know if somebody's diverting. So obviously some inconsistent lab results. You know, if you were sending out for confirmatory testing, do you find buprenorphine or norbuprenorphine as the metabolite in that sample? If not, that may be an indication that, you know, the person may or may not be um, still actively using you know, the prescribed substance. Is buprenorphine only in, a, in that, that urine sample without the, the presence of norbuprenorphine? Um, could mean that the person is tampering with the, the sample. Are they you know, just putting a little bit of uh, buprenorphine in the urine um, to try to, to mask that they're not using? Inconsistent film and pill counts. Again, you know, we can have uh, random pill count days, bring pill bottles in, film strips in to, to count to see are they matching up with your, your counts. Um, are they filling early? Again, going back to that PDMP, are you using that to see if they are consistently coming in early, um, are they using more than, than what they're saying? Or are they they're not even asking um, for refills? So how do you manage that? You know, sometimes we need more frequent testing, sometimes decreasing the, 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 the dosing intervals, you know, going from you know, a, a month script back down to a two week script to a week script um, may be beneficial. Observing, um, Administration of these medications can be important. But also um, increasing support. Do they need more frequent appointments? Do they need different types of, of counseling? Do they need more family therapy? Other alternatives and modalities may be important as well. And then, you know, potentially uh, referring to opioid treatment program um, for either, you know, continuing to um, initiating methadone or alternatives uh, may be the next step. So again, referring to more intensive levels of care, again, this goes back to the willingness um, component that we've been talking about. But having clear discussions, clear guidelines um, between uh, you and the patient and so that they understand 
you know, if this happens, we may need to consider alternatives um, for your safety and for your, your, your goal of recovery. And so other um, levels of care you know, include um, instances of outpatient programming, personal hospitalizations, um, opioid treatment programs, i.e. methadone maintenance programs, inpatient psych facilities that they were starting to express you know, self-harm or harm to other behaviors or thoughts, um, even residential, you know, longer term um, uh, facilities. So lastly, um, last subject, describing patient selection for fuel agonist, i.e. methadone, or um, antagonist treatment. So who is most likely to, to benefit from um, some you know, Trexone? So some of the well, um, prognostic indicators for that is you know, having, again, a good therapeutic alliance with somebody, somebody that, that is um, building on that trust that you've established in the get-go. Are they highly motivated? Do they want to um, to be on this type of medication? Are they engaged in treatment? Have they been adherent to um, the different um, particulars out of the treatment um, protocols that you have in place? Do they prefer it? Again, patient preference should always be taken into consideration. Do they want to be on an antagonist versus an agonist? Um, if, again, you're um, trying to um, have your goal of one and they have the other, then that's going to set you up for a potential failure. Um, so if, if they want it and they're appropriate, it's not a bad, um, bad recommendation. Is their job uh, preventing them from being on an agonist? Um, and so needing to be on an antagonist is important. Are they able to actually access um, and pay for it? Um, are they currently abstinent from opioids but still at a pretty high risk of relapse? Do they fail at previous um, treatments? Um, such as, you know, obviously continuing to use uh, heroin. Uh, did nothing improve? Did they drop out? Was there um, those kinds of breaks in the treatment? So, methadone. Again, it gets a, a bad rap. Methadone can be a very, very beneficial medication uh, for some folks. Um, not everybody, nobody is, is cookie cutter, not everybody's the same. So what way, what may work great for one person may work abysmally for the next and vice versa. So not everyone is cut out for buprenorphine and not everybody's cut out for methadone, but not to overlook that as a potential option for anybody. So, um, Again, if somebody is preferring more of the agonist therapy, um, methadone may be a good option. Do they need more of a, uh, an intense structure with, uh, um, with some, some finite rules and, and, and um, day in and day out structure of, of observed dosing? Do they prefer having kind of services all in one location, sometimes with outpatient um, buprenorphine therapy? You know, you may be the prescriber and they may be getting their therapy from a different location, a different provider altogether. Um, so some folks may do better because methadone clinics have uh, the medication as well as the therapy in the same facility. Um, are these people in some unstable psychosocial situations? Are they not able to ensure, you know, the security of that medication? Um, whether that's being homeless or, you know, constantly moving from, from home to home or living in areas where there's, you know, frequent break-ins and they can't secure their um, their belongings, much less their, their medication. They have co-occurring pain that is not being really adequately treated otherwise. And are they unable to abstain from opioids um, on a partial agonist? Have they tried and are just still not working? So the treatment agreement. Um, Multi-party um, releases are often very beneficial for improving the coordination of care. So before you know, getting started with the treatment, again, making goals and expectations clearly defined, clearly understood, um, so that way there's no misunderstandings in, in black and white. You both know what's going on. Considering those those multidisciplinary releases, as we mentioned, helps keep everybody on the same page. So. Using you know, treatment agreements um, is, in my opinion, a very important part because, again, it's, it's setting up the framework, it's setting up the dynamic um, for you both to be successful in this, this partnership. So what can the patient expect from you and from the treatment? What are you then you going to expect from the patient? Again, this is a give and take. This is a, a partnership. Um, 
So understanding both both uh, ends of that spectrum. So information for the patients about um, buprenorphine that's safe use should also be included as far as what it is, how it is, safe use of it. Um, as far as a, I've, you know, you have also a hard copy of it. We've been talking about it, we've been discussing it, we've verbally been communicating it, but you've also got it in your hand. Informed consent as far as being um, in treatment, and you can find some of these tools um, at the link in this module. Um, also knowing referral sources in the community, um, if they're unable to follow this agreement, and again, meaning that more intensive level of care. Again, some of these uh, examples can be found in the, the, the Tip 40 um, a book, um, as well as the, the, the website um, that's on the, uh, the module there. So treatment agreements, um, some key components. So like most relationships, most uh, um, appointments, making sure that everybody's arriving on time punctually. Um, if they're consistently late, that's going to make it uh, pretty hard to make uh, the, the relationship work. Being courteous in the office, um, not just to you, and this is important, but also to every member of the team as well. So if they are just totally smiles and nice to you, but they are um, kind of a, a rude and, and obstructionist to your, your clinical staff, that needs to be addressed because, again, every part of the, the, the staff is important and plays a role in recovery for this patient. So, so they're not coming intoxicated or under the influence of drugs. Sometimes it may be subtle, but if you pick up on it, having a discussion and say, we may need to, to reschedule this appointment because it appears that you are um, under the influence. Um, now, of course, if you do um, discover that, then making sure that they can get home safely. So if they are, if they drove themselves, um, they need to have alternatives in place. Having an agreement that um, they will not sell, share, or give the medication to others. Again, in the misuse standpoint, this medication is prescribed for this person and this person only. Um, agreeing not to deal, steal, or conduct other illegal or destructive activities, both on as well as off site. Um, because being in jail makes it pretty hard to continue this treatment with you. Um, medications um, may be provided only during scheduled office visits. You're not going to do in between, you're not going to have that phone call in. That the patient is responsible for the safe storage of the medications. Again, you know, sometimes lost and stolen um, medications may not have uh, refills called in or bridges called in. I'm um, agreeing not to obtain medications from other providers, uh, physicians, or other sources without talking to you first and, and discussing it. Some body may be going into um, a surgery, but if they don't tell you beforehand that they're not going to surgery, that can pose a problem. They may be getting opioids and that treatment provider that's doing the surgery may not know they're doing this. And so again, that release of information, that collaboration, knowing that they're going to get potentially medications from other sources um, is important to, to work through. And of course, agreeing to follow the instructions for the, for the prescription and not taking it into their own hands. A lot of folks will try with they way quote unquote had experience and you know in tinkering with different dosing, but knowing and telling them that no, if there's any medication adjustments that are going to be made, it's going to be made after a conversation um, with you as the physician. Sometimes even made not then. So, uh, in summary, um, the initial eval is is comprised of um, the significantly important um, therapeutic alliance. Um, I cannot harp, cannot harp on that enough. Um, but also obtaining other data uh, for the treatment planning and initiation of, of services. So. The important concepts and, and components, medical history, psychiatric history, substance use history. Um, some of these, you know, how you document may vary um, depending on practice and providers, um, but the, the knowledge that, that you need to uh, obtain from those um, key areas is so important. Also, don't forget, physical exam. I can tell you what's going on now, but also can, to continue to keep in mind, some of the, the medical complications in the future um, as sequelae from somebody's substance use. So office-based opioid treatment um, can be appropriate for, um, for patients that are able to receive this level of care um, and can be provided in an outpatient setting. However, some patients may benefit from stabilization either before or even sometimes during treatment 
um, and they need higher levels of care on the fluids. It's fluid therapeutic. Methadone, um, or naltrexone, um, are also options for medication-assisted therapy. So don't you know, don't overlook those. I know when I'm, when I'm um, reviewing and discussing discussing uh, treatment recommendations and, and and options, I lay everything out on the table. You know, that way, again, the patient can have their preference input as far as what they feel is going to be most beneficial to them. Now, again, you may have recommendations and may disagree, um, and having that discussion is important too. But when you have a patient have buy-in with their preference and hearing that you will take their um, their input seriously, again, that goes back to and helping that therapeutic alliance to get them to where they want to. So other folks may be more suitable for one of these other alternatives, and that's okay. Um, because even um, buprenorphine is not an effect is not effective for everybody and is, may not be appropriate for everybody. So keep an eye on that as a whole. So I appreciate you listening um, and hopefully um, learned a lot during during this module and we'll continue to learn um, more so in the, the modules to come. So thank you very much.